Hey everybody, this is Jimmy Savoini. Welcome to episode three of Fish Recon Podcast. Hey, I want to tell you guys a little bit today about a product that I found a few years ago that I've been using. Uh, a lot of times when I get off the water, it's just a great, great, versatile product to wipe my boat down. You know, everybody likes to keep their boat shiny, keep it clean. It's from the Lucas Oil family of products called Slick Mist Marine Speed Wax. And what I love about this product is just how easy it is to use. I keep a bottle of it in the truck. If you spray it on, you wipe it off. It's so easy to use. And it just restores a, a wax on shine. It looks brand new, works on wet and dry surfaces. And as I said, I keep it in the truck because I use it on my truck too. You know, we're in uh, we're in our monsoon season here where I live, and that means rainy roads and uh, muddy roads all the time. It's hard to keep your vehicle clean too. So I just keep a bottle of that with me, get home, take it on, spray it on, wipe it off. You, it looks like you just ran through the car wash. What a great product, this Lucas Oil Slick Mist Marine Speed Wax. It prevents hard water spots, so you'll have that fresh wax feel to it. And I really highly recommend it to you guys. Clean your boat, clean your truck, clean your car. Another great product from the Lucas Oil family of products. In a world where predators lurk below the water's surface, Humanity has been left searching for answers on how to catch these creatures. Now, two men set out to solve the mysteries of fishing and to share that information with you. So get ready as Gary Key and Jimmy Savoini bring you Fish Recon Podcast. 121, those numbers mean anything to you, dude? The proof of my favorite liquor? <laughs> uh, no, M maybe not. Um, although I have maybe, just maybe, drank a little 121 proof liquor. I'm not, can't remember when. Uh, I'm guessing it's the temperature in Phoenix, Arizona, right now. Uh, it is the temperature in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's hotter than Hades out there. 121. That that's a bit much. And I live in Arizona because I love the heat. But you start getting above 112, uh, you know, on upwards of 115, and it's just it's too hot to function. Well, it, it is. And I mean, we're in June and that's typical. And I live a hundred miles north of you up in Prescott and we're at 5,600 feet in altitude. And it, we, we, we recorded 102, 103 today. You know, we don't get over a hundred up here very often, 105. So we are in the midst of a major heat wave. And I was going to say, you know, a lot of the people I know that have moved to the valley have moved because not so much that they love the heat, but that they they don't like the cold. They don't they come from places that are extreme. It's it's extreme cold, and they like the milder winters. But they always forget, or they're at least reminded this time of year why Phoenix has it, it can just get so hot. You know, and you know we don't get over 120 very often in, in our desert areas, but every once in a while we do, and boy, it is an oven. It's brutal. It's brutal. And I was taking my wife to work this morning and it was a little after seven, maybe seven fifteen or so. And I looked at the temperature and it was one Oh two. And I'm like, we're not even into the morning yet. And we're triple digits. That's just, yeah. that's just too hot. Well, and that's the thing about the Valley. I mean, my wife's in Ohio and Toledo right now at a conference and she, it's actually a little chilly there for what she came from. And she's flying home tomorrow night and you know there's been some interruptions in flights because of the extreme heat she doesn't fly in till like 9 p.m tomorrow night but she she said you know what's it? i said well the problem is at 9 and 10 p.m in phoenix it's still 110 degrees so you, you know when it gets over 120 in the daytime you don't get a lot of cooling off at night so we're we're locked in we're in we're in the we're in the oven so to speak and uh we'll get through it but boy it's hot i didn't know this but apparently if it gets too hot, they can't fly planes. And right. I originally thought it was because, you know, it was more of a kindness to the to the to the workers, you know, out on the concrete and, and whatnot. And and I'm certain that that's part of it. But I found out the other day that when it gets too hot, the planes can't get enough power and lift. They need a longer runway. And as an example, you know, in Arizona, our runway is is fairly short. So when it gets over, I think about one fifteen is the threshold. They got to shut the airport down. They don't have a long enough runway. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, and and uh, that that's what it is. Sure. Yeah, the airline industry is just so concerned about everybody all the time. So that's why they don't want anybody. But no, I'm sure that's part of it. I'm being smart with all the trouble the airlines have had lately. They probably don't think much about the guys out there in 150 degrees on that concrete or that asphalt either. But no, there is some physics involved apparently, and uh, 
you know, so we've had we've had all kinds of extreme temperatures here the last few days. Yep, and it won't be long though before the monsoon season kicks in and brings in humidity, and that usually cools the overall temperature down. However, it doesn't make it feel any better. It actually gets sticky and kind of muggy and bad. But right. Uh, well, lots going on right now. I'm pretty excited because of the NHL expansion draft. Uh, oddly enough, Las Vegas now has a hockey team, and tonight they are they are selecting uh, who the who their players are going to be. So. I'm pretty excited about that, and um, lots of good things going on for my favorite sport next to fishing, which is hockey. You know, very interesting about Vegas. They just recently acquired the uh, the NFL football franchise Raiders as well. And oh, that's uh, right, that's right. Got so, it. well, and I guess they feel like that demographic's growing, and and they're gonna. I don't know, Vegas. I mean, we get up there pretty regularly, living here close, and having Lake Mead there to fish, and it just doesn't seem like the demographic that can support those major professional franchises. I guess they've done their research and they feel like they can, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. So it's good to see it's good to see the NHL growing out west, especially when we don't have a huge hockey presence or haven't traditionally. I mean, we've got the Coyotes, and we've certainly built in that direction in the last two decades. Uh, my son's playing hockey right now, for example, and absolutely loves it. He's eight years old, and he's he's just into hockey big time. And those opportunities when I was a kid growing up in Arizona just weren't available. So to have those kind of things come our way I think is great, and we wish him all the best and, and Vegas all the best as well. So hopefully hopefully that works out and they can make that franchise run real well up there. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I know our, our friendly neighbors up north in Canada probably hate the fact that uh, we have another hockey team in the desert, but uh, it is what it is, and I'm excited. Well, it's interesting, Gary, because and I and we could make a whole podcast on this, and it's way off the subject, but it's very <laughs> interesting to think about. Canada, the mecca of hockey uh, on the North American continent, these kids grow up, that I mean, they're born in a hockey net, right? And yep. they've lost franchise after franchise. And it's interesting that, yeah, sure, because it's their national pastime. I mean, they don't just – they look at hockey like we look at NFL football or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and why is it – and I would ask you real quick and then we'll transition on something else. But, but why is it do – they keep losing Calgary, Winnipeg. I mean, you can go through the list of of Canadian cities that have lost hockey franchises. I don't understand that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I, I have an answer outside of, you know, drawing a good enough crowd and putting a good enough product out on the ice. I think it ultimately comes down to that. You know, I think if they were selling out every every game you know during the season that it wouldn't be a problem but it's not just a problem in canada right and we have that same problem in the united states uh, the minnesota north stars moved down to dallas in i think 90 or 91 which as you know dallas is my favorite hockey team the dallas stars and oddly enough i actually used to fish tournaments in texas against one of the back then active dallas stars players a guy by the name of pat verbeek and he was a gritty player, a great player that Dallas had. I believe they picked tough him up guy. from. Yeah, oh, tough guy, yeah. They actually, his nickname was the Little Ball of Hate. And uh, he would get in the corners and grind it out. And the other teams just hated Pat Verbeek. But he was, a, he was a solid player. But, you know, he would get off the ice after a game. And if they had an off day the next day and it was a Saturday, he would be out on the water fishing. And he was actually pretty you good just fisherman. Always, you just always hope that you uh, didn't come nose to nose with Pat Verbeek on the same point trying to fight over the same spot because uh, you didn't want that you, little ball of hate to show itself on the water. That's right. right. You'd lose that Imagine. fight. You'd lose that well, fight. Well, that's cool. I do Very remember, cool. and I guess this probably would have been, I think it was 98. Might have been, yeah, 98 or maybe early, early 90, spring of 99. But I actually went to a Dallas Stars game back then at Reunion Arena and watched the Dallas Stars face off against the Detroit Red Wings, whom you know I hate. I don't like the Red Wings. No offense to anyone. Well, actually, maybe offense to whoever. Uh, well, Detroit to Red actually Wings quite fan. a few, but <laughs> that's right. That's it is right. what it is, as you say, right? Yep. And Verbeek got in a fight that, that night on the ice, and the next day I had a tournament on Lake Tawakany, which is about an hour east of Dallas. Great fishery. Wish, hope we can go there sometime. And, uh, and so the next morning... Guess who's there signing up for the tournament with a with a black eye, Pat Verbeek. 
And you knew, of course, and probably a lot of your your f- fellow fishermen knew too. But you knew exactly what had happened because you, being the stars fan that you are, uh, you knew s- exactly what had gone on the night before. But uh, hey, at least he, true to the fisherman and true to the tournament guy, uh, little old fight on the ice wasn't going to keep him from fishing a tournament. So That's right. the little ball uh, that is hate. a testament to our fortitude. Lots of hockey players are are fishermen. I've I've learned over the years. You know, you read kind of what they do in the off season. There are a lot of hockey players that are avid avid fishermen. So and not just hockey players, and and uh, I think professional sports people. Um, you know, and I mean, we see them in the tournament world because it's kind of a national, uh, a, a natural, pardon me, trans uh, transition for them because you got the competitive nature that runs through all of those guys. But uh, I've got quite a few friends that are either former professional athletes or, or pro athletes that really take to fishing and, and they're outdoors people to start with too. It seems like, uh, we're going to have a guy on down the road, a friend of mine who pitched for the diamondbacks was drafted out of high school and has hunted and fished basically all over the world. And you know, there's just a lot of professional athletes that, that seem to gravitate towards fishing. And, uh, you know, that's another interesting subject we could probably cover one of these times too. What, is there any, what, what makes the professional athlete do that? I mean, it's something they grow up with and they grow up outdoors. They come from all walks of life, but, uh, you, you, you definitely see their presence in, in a lot of, uh, of fishing applications. Those guys love to fish and hunt too, for that matter. Yeah. And that got me thinking, as I was thinking through our last podcast and we talked about, sort of that accepted amount of embellishment between fishermen, right? We, you know, fishermen, fishermen are synonymous with, with being embellishers. Last episode, we, we flat out called liars, but the truth is, I mean, fishermen are just known for embellishing. It was bigger than it was. And if it got away, it was even bigger than what we've ever even saw. We just sort of kind of make up how big it was. And it got me thinking, and we, we brought it up about there are very few, very few. I don't think it's a common occurrence, but there are a few occasions where certain individuals take it beyond what's acceptable. And we, we talked about, you know, the cheater that was caught at Lake Mead shoving fish, you know, sho- shoving weights down a fish's stomach, as ridiculous as that is. But I don't think it's that common. But it got me thinking that in all sports, in all games, really, I don't even want to say necessarily sports, but all games, if you win a lot, you're going to be accused of cheating. Well, yeah, and you're, you got a target on your back for sure. And, and uh, I, I think that that's just a manifestation of success probably. Yeah, for sure. And it's unfair. And, and I don't like it. And, and I've even found myself throughout my lifetime seeing somebody who wins consistently. Maybe it's a team that I hate. And there was a time when the Detroit Red Wings were winning a lot. And I, you know, I hated the Red Wings. And and it's like you, your your knee jerk reaction. I call it a knee jerk reaction because deep down you probably don't really believe it. But the knee jerk reaction is, well, they're cheating. You know, they're getting away with, they're getting away. The the refs let them get away with everything, and we hear that in sports all the time. Well, the refs let them get away with everything, especially basketball, right? And I'm not a huge NBA fan, but you see it a lot in, in, in basketball. You see it a lot in football. Well, the refs are letting them get away with everything. You know, the other day you and I were talking, and you brought up the the New England Patriots and and some of the controversy that surrounds them. And I just think all in all in sports, it's unfair. I even see it with my kids. You know, my kids will be playing a board game or something like that. And and one of the kids will win, maybe win two games in a row. Well, you're cheating. And it's like, there's like a natural tendency to, to discount our failings in favor of knocking somebody down for their successes. I will give you a prime example. My son played, on a state hockey team this over the course of this last year they were very well coached and very well organized and we made it down to the state tournament and i was off doing a fishing event and doing some video and doing some different stuff so i missed the first day of this tournament and going into the tournament the kids were 21 and 0 they hadn't been beaten they'd won every tournament that they'd been in and Wow. They were just very good, you know. Impressive and we record. Get, Impressive well, record. It, especially for, you know, I never thought I could care so much about 8U hockey. But, uh, you know, uh, and you want to see parents fight? You had to, <laughs> there's nothing in the fishing world compared to 8U hockey parents from opposing teams. And it's gotten a little ridiculous. But I was on my way down there after this event on Saturday. And Sunday would have been the, the final day. And they had lost to their rival team out of Phoenix. And they had lost 3-2. to two, and so they weren't out of the tournament because it was one of those deals where you could lose one and come back through the loser's bracket, play for the championship, and ultimately they ended up winning the whole deal. But 
all I heard from the coaches and from the parents was that there was a hole in the net on the other end and that the team, we scored two goals that weren't counted because the refs were in cahoots with the Phoenix team. Now, how about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eight U hockey, and I'm hearing on an undefeated season, and we're not out of the tournament, that we should have won that game too had it not have been for the collusion between the eight U refs and the Phoenix coaches. How about that? Losing so there sucks. You go. Losing well, sucks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, you talk about, and it's interesting because this is a, this is a topic that we all know people – that have been accused of cheating or that, and again, I try to stay humble in my approach to those things. I've probably been accused of it a time or two on good runs when I've been winning or whatever it is. And we all know, and, and you know, there's, but there's enough examples out there, albeit they're rare. Like you say, they're, they're rarities and you don't see it very often, but I can tell you there was a big, big bass contests are some of the places where these guys have cheated the most. And I was just reading an article the other day where a guy had shoved a weight down a fish. Well, there was one right here in Arizona not a couple, two, three years ago where there was a guy who people had suspected of cheating because he had been winning, but he'd been fishing by himself. And nobody could prove it, but they found out that this guy had transplanted in this big bass contest, which was worth $50,000, you know, a new truck. I mean, there's big prizes involved in this stuff. And... Right at daylight, he launched his boat, and one of the other competitors walked over and opened his live well, and there was a six-pound bass sitting in there, and the tournament haven't even hadn't even started yet. Oh, so, right. I remember that. Yeah, I and, remember that. Yeah, so he went and reported them, and they caught the guy red-handed, and he was ostracized from the sport. He moved out of the state. It basically affected his life top to bottom, and he had committed contest fraud. And again, while I truly believe that that is a very rare situation— Anytime we hear about that, it sticks in our mind. And so, you know, it's an interesting subject to talk about cheating and the manifestation of cheating and where it comes from and, and, and how prevalent is it and, and who does, you know, because I, I firmly believe, as you do as well, that it, it is very much the exception. But it, it lends itself to people forming opinions and starting to think things. I think that's part of it. You know, what, what causes people to to label somebody as a cheater when they have no evidence whatsoever. Yeah, and I and everybody has a passion that's strong. And some people fall into a category of what I call a passion and a love for winning. And there are some people who fall into a category with a passion of a hatred for losing. And I ask the question of myself and, and I think when I think about other people do you love fi which passion is greater your love for winning or your hatred for losing and there are a few people that fall into that category of a hatred for losing they would they more so than the love for winning if they win they like it but if they lose they hate it and it can it can completely train wreck them and i think there those type of people are the kind that are looking for places to point the blame rather than looking at themselves and saying you know what, I, I didn't have a good tournament. I just didn't have a good tournament. I didn't execute or I couldn't figure them out. I just could not figure the fish out. I think those people at times have a tendency to want to, they push the envelope too far by accusing others of cheating. And in the fishing world, particularly at the in the team events, if you win and you win often, somebody's accusing you of cheating. I had mentioned before living on Lake Tawakani, that's where I fished tournament where Pat Verbeek from the Dallas Stars fished. I, I lived right on the lake. Literally, you could throw a rock from my doorstep to the waterfront. And in the summertime, they would have these Thursday evening tournaments. So in, in Texas, the time changes, you know, for daylight saving time. So you get a little extra hour throughout the summer. And I remember every Thursday, I would take off work just a little bit early. I would race home, I'd get the boat ready. And my team partner would meet me at the boat ramp, we'd jump in the boat, we'd pay our whatever the entry fee was, maybe 40 bucks a team. It was pretty, pretty cheap. And, sure. and, and they drew pretty good. They drew maybe 30 boats. 
and we would go out and we'd fish these these Thursday night summer tournaments, and they would run from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., and it was just a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Oh, I, I used to fish those formats, always enjoyable, and something, you know, you're, you're out there fishing in, in the twilight, the good times. It's just a great, great format, like you say. Yeah, you get to watch the watch the sunset, and right about then it's about 9 o'clock, because it would, you know, it would get... Top water bite. Right? Oh, top so. water. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. You're in the middle of summer, and it's hot, and... And uh, it actually, for me, it actually made me a better fisherman because you're forced to figure them out really quick. Sure, you know, absolutely. Three-hour tournament goes by pretty darn fast. But there was one summer where we figured out a bite, and and I think this is partly what leads to being accused of being a cheater because as fishermen, we are naturally secretive, right? When we figure out something good, uh, whether we're fishing tournaments or not, if we're if we're saltwater fishing or trout fishing or whatever kind of fish we're fishing for when you figure out something good you kind of have the tendency to want to keep it a secret you might we tell guard. your friends yeah we yeah, do yeah and, and it's nothing, nothing wrong with that so we we figured out a bite and and it was a crankbait bite and, and i don't remember which it was me or my team partner that figured it out but they were these little fire tiger crankbaits and we figured out in a three-hour tournament if we threw those crankbaits along the riprap of the dam and on some of the bridge levees we could cover a lot of water fast, and we could put fish in the boat very, very quickly. And so we did that one tournament, and we, we won the tournament. So in those Thursday night tournaments, we ended up winning five tournaments in a row. And after the third one, the rumors were already flying around that we were cheating. Oh, I'm and, sure. And I remember being caught off guard on this. I'm like, well, it's a three-hour Thursday night tournament with a $40 entry fee. Why on earth would we be cheating, and how on earth would we even have the time to cheat? And why why are these accusations coming? And and I was frustrated by it. Yeah, because it's a personal affront to to especially to the honest person. Okay, so you know, you and I go out there and we we leave it all on the table. We fish as hard as we can. We do what we can, and and we try to do the best we can. And sometimes we win, and sometimes we don't. But at no point in time do honest people. it, It doesn't even cross their minds when 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 you're honest and you're not doing anything wrong then it doesn't even cross your mind that there might be people looking at you through that kaleidoscope, you know, that, that and so it, it actually digs down to the core fiber of an honest person. I mean, it's, 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 it's crushing to, to think that somebody would look at you because what you did was everything you're supposed to do. You're supposed to put it together. You're supposed to pattern the fish. You're supposed to figure out what they're eating. And when you do, you want to reap the rewards. And as you know, in the summertime, a lot of times, especially on reservoirs, those bites are predictable. The spots reload. You might have hit these pilings when the current was just right, and the, the draws through the dam are consistent. And so you, 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 you actually knitted the sweater correctly. And to have somebody turn around or a group of people, and you know how that stuff does, catches on like wildfire, oh, accuse you of cheating, it, it, hurts, mm-hmm. it, it gets you to the core. Uh, but, you know, I want to back up really quickly on, on a situation because I really believe that this idea of, of cheating and fraud is – is there's a ton of different reasons why people do it. And you touched on uh, what I think is, is really the core question. Do you, do you love winning so much or hate losing so much? Which, which is it for you? And I think the people that really truly hate losing – I mean I love to win. But I'm in my approach is, is, is you – and this is the way I grew up – is you work as hard as you can. And you make the right decisions, and if you do the right things, you win. And I've always been taught to win with humility and always try to, to be thankful for, for the wins that I get. And I truly believe to, to, that to be a winner, you have to learn how to lose first. And some people never do that. But when so, – so when you talk about a smaller contest where – I'm gonna guess you guys maybe had thirty or forty boats in your in your little night you know weekly tournament yep. at forty dollars a piece. That's not that much money. It's not life changing. So I think really we we need to talk quickly about the incentive that that you present in any any scenario which can make people cross certain lines. And I recently read an article. I sent you the article about. A, co- a court case that just got finished being litigated where this guy had won $2.8 million in a Marlin tournament, but he failed three polygraph tests from three different polygraph companies or people and totally, totally independent of one another. And he failed all three of them and they took his prize away. Well, $2.8 million, that's a lot. And so, 
you know, I think I think to really get a full grasp on what causes people to cross certain lines, um, you know, obviously two point eight million dollars in a tournament like that might cause some people to do some things they normally wouldn't do. Uh, but in a in a smaller scenario where the winnings or the prize or whatever the case, maybe there's even no money on the line. Maybe it's just maybe it's in a different setting where there's just a a trophy or a cup, not life changing, not life altering, and not something that would make somebody actually turn somebody into a criminal for the gain that they may get. What causes that? Because I can't, I can't guess that these these weekly, nightly tournaments that you guys used to get in. I mean, if you won them, it wasn't going to change your life. You weren't going to move to Park Avenue, and exactly. you know, exactly. I, I mean, so well, so it, it it put us in a quandary. It put us in a quandary because. We weren't cheating, obviously. And, and like I said before, I just don't think cheating happens that often. I, I think for the most part, the people that are accused of cheating are, are that comes from a bunch of sore losers who are bitter about losing. And in our case, it simply put us in a quandary because it's like, do we go through the effort of proving to someone that we're not cheating by allowing them to see what we do? But in doing so, we basically give up our secret. And, and we got onto a bite that nobody else got. We were throwing crankbaits, a particular color that I, I thought the right. color was significant. And we were running a pattern and we never saw any other boats running running that pattern. And it's like, why would I feed into false accusations by giving up the good that we're doing um, just to squelch a rumor, which ultimately probably wouldn't squelch a rumor? Or do we just ignore it and allow the rumors to fly? We, we chose to ignore it and allow the, the I, I rumors was gonna to fly. Say, I was going to say, I would guess you would have ignored it knowing, because, I, again, the person that is clear of conscience, the person that is not doing anything wrong, knows they're not doing anything wrong. And you, you didn't lose a wink of sleep over that. I mean, it bothered you that there would be people so shallow as to find excuses. But as you have accurately pointed out, a lot of times... And, you know, we all know instances of purported cheating or people. I mean, how many times have you heard it? that, that they're cheating, they're cheating, they're cheating? And I got tired of hearing it from from certain people and certain times. And I, I really just got sick of it because here's the bottom line. And you'll hear it. I mean, you see it all the way up for our, our Congress people that can't get a along and can't agree on anything they go and they have all these hearings all the time and they try to bring this person down or that person down and not a shred of evidence is presented ever and so I, I finally got to tell and you know and I mean and it's easy if you're a competitor against some of these it's easy to feed into that because you you know there, there's a there's a tendency in hu our human nature to want to buy into that because it offers us comfort and we kind of talked about that in the last podcast too about not giving up spots or not giving up information where even if you gave up wrong information it, it was closure for the other for the other person because they, they just want to hear something you know so it's mm -hmm. easy to feed into those things but we uh, again have, yeah, no, show great. me the evidence exactly show me the evidence and that's usually what's lacking and you and i have some friends uh, a lot of friends that have had success winning multiple times multiple tournaments and the rumors fly that they're somehow cheating but nobody can seem to come up with any evidence. And all these people do is continue to win. And the, I had some friends also that, that fish Lake to walk in a lot, and they ran through a time where they had a good winning streak and streak, and they were also accused of cheating. And we used to talk about it a little bit. And the best advice I ever got was from one of the guys on the other teams that went through that spell of where they were accused of cheating. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, wear it as a badge of honor. He said, if people are accusing you of cheating and you're winning, just wear it like a badge of honor because you know you're not. So that's what we did. And you know what? It got to be a point where that was the goal. You know, try to win enough where somebody out there would accuse you of cheating because you don't care. You're not cheating. And you know you're not. And, and that's the bottom line. And again, like we've talked about, I just, you, you've got to produce the evidence at some point in time. And so, you know, I would say this too, that a lot of these guys that are accused, they're accusing of cheating are very accomplished anglers and they're smart guys. They work at their craft and trade. And sometimes guys just have more time in, on the water than a lot of guys. You know, if you're working 60 hours a week and you come down and fish a tournament on, on part time and there's been guys out there that have fished all week because that they have the ability to do so, they've already gained a lot of information. And, and you may, you may have that conversation that that's not 
fair and that that's that's what's caused it but to 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 out and out accuse somebody of cheating and, and a lot of these people that we talk about they're very skilled at what they do they're not bad fishermen they don't need to put live bait on the end of their line to catch fish i mean they they know what they're doing well we have a very special guest tonight and he's a friend of both of ours and he's won at every level and i've been watching him for years i remember when he was much younger fishing on the lower colorado river and he's been successful like i said he's been successful at every level he's won an flw event he's won i don't know how many boats we'll have to ask him on the show but like most anglers if not all anglers that go on a good winning streak he's had lots of accusations against him and he has done something by the way by by the same people that go up and shake his hand at events or see him and pat him on the back and like him on facebook and friend him on facebook all these people that he that they call billy oh he's my friend he's my buddy are some of the same people that were are turning around and 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 making these accusations behind his back wouldn't you wouldn't you agree yeah and, and all he has done is continued to win and be successful. And he is one of those, I consider him one of those unique individuals who, you know, you've seen that show, The Dog Whisperer, um, who has a unique ability to understand dogs. And, and and our friend, I think he has that natural, unique ability to understand fish and understand bass. And he is just, I believe he is just that good. He is that good. Well, and you mix in the fact that he is a very skilled and talented angler with the fact that he has lots of time to spend on the water and you mix those two ingredients together and you would expect he's going to win it's a, a lot. it's a lethal combination and I, he has a very very interesting story to tell i've been dying to get to it with him because i really as you say i mean we're friends we're colleagues we, we've fished around each other quite a lot and you know i've never found him to be anything but cordial nice uh and and he's done things off the water that that really complement his skills as an angler, and so I think he's got a great story to tell, and I'm very much looking forward to bringing it to everybody because it's one that I felt needed to be told for a long time. Well, he has done something, and I've shared this with him. I I've, I've talked to him and said I I think what you have done is nothing shy of brilliance, and we're going to get to that coming up right after this short break. Stay tuned, everybody. Gary and Kimmy will be right back. Online with us now, we have Mr. Billy Skinner. Billy, we are thrilled to have you on the show tonight. Thank you for joining. Oh, yeah. I'm thrilled to be here, brother. So, Billy, you, um, you've you accomplished a lot. You've won a lot of tournaments. You have your own bait company. You have your own TV show. I mean, is there anything left on the bucket list? Uh, do those same things, but a little better every day. You know what I mean? Nice, <laughs> nice. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, you know known Billy for a long time and watched a lot of these things happen. What I'm kind of curious to, to ask you, Billy, is give us a little background on Billy Skinner. You know, how did you grow up and what, what fostered your love for fishing? Man, I know, uh, do you guys know where El Centro, California is? I sure. sure do, yep. That is where I grew up. And if you know it good, you know there's pretty much zero water there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of dry canals, right? A lot of farming, not a lot of fishing, but... Uh, that's how I grew up fishing was fishing the dirt drainage canals with my mom. And uh, I didn't, I, this is actually kind of a cool story for Gary. I didn't know a whole lot about tournament fishing. I definitely didn't know that you could ever make pretty decent money doing it. And the very first time, even though I lived in uh, Imperial Valley growing up, my very first time to the river over here in Yuma, Gary won the tournament. Oh, Nice. Really? <laughs> okay. He might have won it with me. <laughs> Very possible. Uh, was it an ABA? Uh, it was, and I'm going to say it had to be like maybe 10 years ago. I'm yeah. saying 2007. Yeah. And, yeah. I think I think him and I fished together. We may have won that tournament. T to Yuma and down in the lower Colorado, that was your first time over there or just your first tournament over there? Both. That was my I'll first be... time to the river and first tournament. Wow. wow. And you were hooked. Oh, dude, that was it. I, I got, I think I got third or fourth, and I got a check, and I go, man, this beats the sh the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
and you know, have- and it, it has that way of doing it to you. And I mean, it, it's amazing. But but you know, all of us here, we know so many people that tournament fish for all these different reasons and all these things that drive us. And I. I still think the passion that, that, you know, hell, I'm 51 now. I've been fishing tournaments for a long time. I've had my share of successes and not and moderately and, and haven't changed the world of bass fishing. But, you know, you've had these, you, you've won FLW events, national events. You've won more, more team tournaments than you can probably ever count. It has given you, so, so I guess what I wonder is, you know, you, you got over there and you got a check in that tournament and it's like, wow, this is pretty freaking cool. I like it. And somehow you've blossomed it into all these entrepreneurial things. And I, it just makes me wonder how a guy like Billy Skinner, you, you've won so many tournaments, you've done all these things. So do you ever just say, hey, you know, I've had enough? Obviously not, because you come out with these lures and these different, you know, you got your own rod line. So what drives you? Why is it everything else then? That's a tough question. I, I think it's just, like you said earlier, it's my love for it. And a lot of the things that have come out of my fishing – I didn't really think a lot about it. It just kind of happened. You know, it was as far as the bait side of things, it was just something that I fished for years. And, and, uh, I know and a lot of people have probably done that, but, and the rods and everything, like when I first started with the rod thing, I was fishing for a rod company and I was breaking a lot of rods and stuff. And I said, Hey, I want to make my own rods and I want to, I want to at least control what I can control. And you wanted to build a better mousetrap, right? I mean, you had ideas on how to build a better rod. Oh, exactly. And if there, there was never any intention to sell any of it, I guess is what I'm getting at. So it was it was first and foremost for myself. And then it just kind of turned into that and blossomed into becoming little businesses here and there and different avenues of fishing. And that and on top of it, we all know that if you're fishing locally, you know, and, and hitting some FLWs here and there and stuff like that, that's not something that you you really want to do for the rest of your life. So you got to kind well, of. Some guys do. I mean, let, let's face it. Some guys think they're going to change the world and they're going to. So how does Dirty Missions come out of all of that? Where, where do you wake up one day and go, hey, man, I need to go take a chainsaw and I need to cut into <laughs> something and I need to try to drown myself trying to get to a fish that. I, I mean, where's that come from? You know, and that that goes along with kind of the same thing as what I was saying was me and my friends did it we've done it for a long time and every time we would do it i would tell uh bucky specifically because most of the time it was me and bucky lay and i would tell him i go man can you imagine putting this stupid shit that we do on camera and showing people we actually are you know just to get a bite and get it i don't know it was just the whole adventure of it and personally i felt fishing television was getting a little stagnant and boring and sure It was kind of getting steered towards the, you know, here's my jersey and here's the products that I'm pushing kind of television. And I wanted it, you know, we're in a, we're just friends in a little aluminum boat that most average everyday guy can afford. And we're just having fun and we're catching fish at the same time. And, but that, I mean, I was in Havasu at the, the Bassmaster Elite tournament when the producer ran into me. And somehow he saw the show on YouTube or something, and it just kind of all fell into place. I'm just, I guess, fortunate when it comes to stuff like that. That's amazing. I would say fortunate or or maybe insightful in the way that, you know, you think about, and, and I think this is what brings us all here, and, and, and thus Gary and I thinking about fishing and its impact and, and being a little bit reflective on what fishing means to us and, and why I think it's important. And I think it's, it's so prevalent. It's woven through the fabric of our society that we would come up with fish recon and want to hear these fishing stories and want to talk to people that had unique experiences in the fishing world. Everything we do today. I mean, if you look at TV today, everything's in real time. Everything's a reality show. I mean, they've taken all these hot gals out of LA and made these real wives of LA. I mean, they've turned these people into superstars for doing nothing nothing but putting well, not to say that I don't mind watching it every once in a while, but they get a b- bikini on run out there in front of the pool and they film it in real time and all of a sudden you got this reality show and that what was the one with the island where everybody gets kicked off the island all that stuff you know Survivor, so yeah. what you have taken what, yeah with dirty missions taken the more of the reality and I think anytime you interject human element and human experience in real time and, and you know everybody wants to see 
that you know well nobody cuts into backwaters with a freaking chainsaw it's interesting in, in that respect i think that's the appeal part of it anyway i mean what you've done billy is what we've all talked about doing but never got off our lazy asses and did right oh yeah and like you said i mean it's there's been so many times where it's absolute misery out there i mean it, it's tough it didn't look fun all the time i'll tell you that <laughs> yeah. i mean you're, you're you're cutting a quarter mile in a in just a you know there's that much room between you you know the cane and the water and you're cutting a tunnel for a quarter mile length and all, all to catch a fish and get a unique shot that you probably and to get into a you know for something that uh, one of a time or one of a kind experience right and so it's all this work it's like you might as well take a jackhammer and go i mean that's that's hellacious work man oh yeah no but it's one of those things when you do it it's it's uh you know, you there's misery in the moment, but then the years after that you and your buddies are standing in the garage drinking a beer and reflecting back on those times, it turns into one of the most amazing times in your life. It's funny how it does that. You know, in the moment, you're hating life, but then later on, you, you reflect back on it, and it, it's just some of the – it's the coolest memories that me, Bucky, Robbie, all of us down here have is from doing Dirty Missions. Sure, there's some bonding involved, and I think we will do a lot to get somewhere where there hasn't been other fishermen to try to catch a fish. All over the country, and maybe even in North America, your commonality with those with people, people could be sitting in Florida and going, "Frick, I did that on Okeechobee, man." You know, I mean, I, I I've been we 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 push pulled our way in, and we dug hell. I ever knew, never knew you could get a get a chainsaw and do. So I think that's where y you have exposed, and that's the appeal with Dirty Missions is is that you find commonality in in all of the risk taking and putting your your freaking kayak in places where you're turning it over and losing all your gear, whatever the case may be, is that you're offering people a, a look into something that a lot of fishermen have done in one form or another if that uh, makes sense you know it just, people it's a dirty mission doesn't have to be necessarily on the level that we're doing it it can be anything i always used to say about me and bucky was uh it, we could be going to the store for a gallon of milk or we could be cutting a quarter mile into a backwater the the name dirty mission came from just me and him hanging out and and, and over time you know just Anything, anything that we did seemed to become much more than it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a, it's incredible, and I encourage everybody to check Dirty Missions out because it's uh, it's just neat, and the way you guys have filmed it and GoPro a lot of the things, and it, it, it's professional, and it, it it's just a great entertaining thing, even for people that don't fish, and that's why I, I think it's important to talk about it because it it shows people a world that is just human experience, and and it's a, a bit extreme. I mean, it's almost like pulling a okay here i go out of my world a fakie 780 on a skateboard or something i don't think you were a skateboarder were you yeah. doing yes sir no no absolutely not yeah, I, it would be a 720 not a 780 780 then i broke my broke my elbow <laughs> right a little over rotated there right so then billy i'm curious to ask you and this kind of leads us to where I, I this could be the fun part of this program not that it hasn't been already you came up with a new bait and it is called the cheater. So <laughs> give us a little background on the cheater, how it came about, why you did it, why you named the, the colors and the things you did, and, and just kind of fill us, fill our audience in on how the cheater came about. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's, it seemed like as, as quickly as I was uh, caught by the world of tournament fishing and I fell in love with it, and it, you know, probably within four years in, into actually tournament fishing a lot and being serious with it, I pretty much learned to not like it as fast because I got pretty tarred and feathered throughout my little career. And it was something that I never really thought about. I mean, in the past, me and Sean had had a predator swim bait company and, and you know, we we're that's Sean Bailey, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And, but there was so many different problems with it, you know, and when it came to this, to, to this is when we had predator, I, I figured out the whole skipping thing and, and I'm not the only one that's ever figured that out and I'll never claim that. A lot of people have, I, I guarantee Gary's been skipping bait down here for a while. <laughs> shh, shh. Can't talk about that. <laughs> my, my buddy Robbie, who's in dirty missions as well. 
and we we had discussed well you know maybe let's do a do a swim bait company again and I told him, you know, I did it once, and I'll tell you what was wrong with it. I get, I, there was no education behind it. All it was was a couple names behind a bait, and it's a bait amongst a hundred different baits. You know, and you but got, you guys did pretty well with it, as I recall. I mean, and and the names behind it at that point, you'd made a pretty good name for yourself. And of course, Sean had too. And I'd been fishing with Sean for a long time, and so you guys and, and, and it swam really well, and it had you know it had some unique features to it. So it, it it's but but right, I mean that you guys were successful in that respect because you had some drive behind it because of the credibility that both of you guys lended to it. But that was with the cheater, you had much more of a design in mind, right? Yeah, it was that, and I, I, I felt like when me and Sean did it, we were preoccupied. You know, we, we started doing it, and we're like, well, shit, you know, we got to fish. We can't be stuck in the shop doing baits and stuff like that. So we kind of didn't really pay enough attention to it. And like I said, there was no – the marketing and education behind it, and every, the whole package wasn't good. It wasn't right, but we did okay. And when it came around to do this one – there was, you know, one thing, as I said, you know, we got to, we got to educate people on it. We have to show them how to fish the bait and that's, what's going to stay successful. And as painful as that was to do, that was the only way I was willing to do it. Otherwise to me, it wouldn't have been worth it. And then when it came time to naming it, that was fun. And I instantly, I was like, you know what? I go, if there's one negative that I can take out of this whole fishing thing was it was always constantly being called a cheater. And I go, I think what we need to do here is we need to turn that negative into a positive. And, and it's something that obviously isn't just with me. I mean, it's all throughout the United States. It's all, I mean, the, the fishing industry is plagued with that. It doesn't matter where you go. We were just talking about that, Billy. And it's not just fishing. It's every sport, every it's life. game. It's life. I mean, I, I mean, I'm a huge, huge hockey fan. I mean, if you see my trailer down there at Fisher's Landing, I've got a giant Dallas Stars flag hanging off my trailer that I put up each time. And I, I hate the Red Wings. And when the Red Wings were winning, I was always finding excuses. It's like, well, the refs are on their side. Well, they're getting away with all these things. They're cheating, you know. And we just have this natural tendency when, when who we don't want to have success or if we're not experiencing success and somebody is – we naturally just want to just point the finger somewhere like, well, they have an advantage and we see it, you know, obviously we see it in basketball. It makes too. us feel better about our it short makes us feel better. It's, it's, uh, it's not, you know, Hey, I just suck today. I couldn't catch the fish. It's like, well, I couldn't catch them and I couldn't figure them out. That means nobody else should have been able to also. And if they did, that means they were, they were cheating, right? They cheated. Yeah. <laughs> Being local here and fishing a lot of the same stuff that we do. I've heard all this stuff for a long time. Gary and I spoke about, about what makes people talk about cheating and accuse people of cheating. And I really believe that there's a psychological thing that gives people, makes people feel better about the, their, their lack of abilities or their lack of performance to, to, if you just paint the person that you can't beat as a cheater, it makes you feel better about yourself. And you, you can walk away from that going, well, how was I supposed to win? I mean, Billy's cheating, you know? And so all this stuff kind of boiled over and it, I, I can't imagine what you must have thought about some of the people that shake your hand at the ramp and call you on the phone and order rods from you and do all these things. So one of the things I told Gary, to be totally fair, is that I'm not advocating one way or the other. I don't know. I know this. Just show me some evidence. If you can't beat these people, and it happened with, with Sean and, and Mike Rook, and, you know, I mean, there's been all this little culture that's been around that, that situation. I said, just find some evidence. You, you, you keep accusing somebody of something. And just, you got to show somebody some evidence. And there's not, you guys have passed lie detectors. You guys have done everything that's ever been asked of you to do. And so that's where I thought this was an important. And then you gave us the platform to really just come out and ask you by naming your baits, the cheater and dog food color and this, that, you know, so <laughs> And this, again, goes back into Fish Recon. I want to tell these kind of stories that we don't – sometimes they're uncomfortable to talk about, and sometimes we don't hear about every day because Billy Skinner has always, in my opinion, held the high road and never said a freaking word about it. He's just been there, and whether you finish 10th 
fiftieth or first, you you collected your money and your trophies and you went away. And I I mean, so that's why I wanted to, and Gary and I both wanted to give you the platform and Fish Recon to talk about it if you wanted to, because you've taken it and turned it into a. I, I'm I'm assuming you're selling quite a few baits these days, right? Yeah, no, I, I you know when we started, I. I I told Robbie, I go, this is going to go one of two ways, good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, well it's, I'll tell you, it is, from what I've observed, I mean, it is like a wildfire. I mean, I'm now out on the river, and I'm just trolling in Lake Martinez, and every boat I pass by is skipping a cheater bait into the Tule's. I'm like, okay, guys, it's an awesome bait, but don't forget, there's... 80 years of bass fishing lures still out there, but I was just laughing because I, you know, it's amazing that how well it's caught on. Now, obviously, social media helps, and there's videos up there, and and, and it's spreading. I, one of my good friends that I grew up with, I grew up in in Lakeside, California, so I drove through El Centro all the time on my way to the river. But one of my friends that I went to high school with, Dominic Lozano, uh, he lives in Texas, and he's throwing the cheater. So it's it's spreading like crazy. Oh, yeah. But you have taken the time to produce videos and instruction on how to properly a- apply that. That's the thing is, is you have actually said, hey, man, we want to sell you this bait for X amount of dollars, but we also want to teach you how to use it correctly. I mean, I think you're, you know, you're, your quote unquote enemies, you're driving them crazy. I don't think you have a lot of them, truly. I think there's a lot of people like to talk a little bit of shit, as we say, but um, overall, I don't think Billy Skinner has a ton of enemies out there. Oh, uh, I got, I got a ton of them. <laughs> but... <laughs> okay. All right. Stand correct. <laughs> That was, that was kind of, I, you know, going back to what you said earlier is that throughout my fishing, I did have to stay quiet on a lot of stuff, a lot of issues. They, there was a lot of, you know, the worst thing is internet forums and stuff like that. And, you know, me, Sean and uh, Justin and a lot of people had to just kind of sit back and let everybody take the heat mud. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty brutal. It was. I mean, not to be dramatic about it, but there was a couple years that were pretty dark when it came to the way that people felt about me and Sean. And it, that that was kind of like, you know, I was an adult already, obviously, but I kind of had this thing where, you know, you, you treat people right and they're going to treat you right and you work your ass off. They're going to sit there and be like, you know what, I'm going to applaud your hard work. Hell no. That uh, that bubble got burst quick as hell. And with this, it was kind of like, this is my opportunity to get back at every single person that drug me through the mud. In a subtle, gonna... way, in a subtle way. And, yeah. and I'm glad you've kind of gone there with it because I really... You know, I think a lot of t- a lot of things that you've done and your successes that you've had is that nobody's ever tried to. Has anybody ever asked, "Hey, Billy, how do you feel as a human being about the way that you've been treated? About some of the some of the things that have been said?" And so, has anybody ever even stopped to even ask you about that? No, absolutely not. Um, the second that I knew it was time to basically quit fishing was uh, the year after I won the FLW on Havasu. They brought the FLW back, and I fished it, and I missed the cut by one pound. You finished 11th. Yeah, I finished 11th, and a guy from when I on day two, from when I walked, when I was on the stage, from when I walked off to when I got to my truck in the parking lot, he followed me from the stage all the way to my truck, and me and about three or four other friends, Clint Goodwin, Chris Kinley, all them – you know them. And uh, for about 40 minutes at the truck, and you keep in mind, from the stage all the way to the truck, this guy called me a cheater. Over and over and over, insinuating all kinds of different stuff. And finally, I actually ended up getting in a fight with the guy, and that was it. I go, this is... What am gone. I doing? Yeah, this has gone way too far. I remember all the, the college teams were up in the parking lot right there watching it. And it, that that wasn't me. That never has been me. And that's where my fishing had. That was the point that it had gotten to at that you know moment. And I was Chris Kinley walked me off to my truck, and I drove home. And I go, this ain't worth it. This is this is crazy. 
This is crazy that people are this adamant that I'm, you know, I just missed the cut by a pound. I'm not out here breaking records. Like I, I'm, I'm not happy right now. I had a tough time. You know, I've, I've had plenty of shitty tournaments. You know what well, I mean? And, sure. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and that's Believe- the part people forget, right? I mean, I've seen you have awesome tournaments and I've seen you have horrible tournaments. And oh, yeah. even at the horrible tournaments, you're still right there hanging out where people can talk to you. And, and I mm-hmm. think people forget that. And it's amazing that people forget that. They've got short memory. You know, if you're going to call somebody, you're saying somebody broke a law, basically. I mean, contest fraud rules, whatever they are. But you're calling somebody consistently a cheater, whether they're fishing in a team tournament or a pro tournament with with basically a co-angler observer. You, you've got this stigma that has, has become so much bigger than your passion and love for the sport. And people forget the humanness that is involved, that there's a person there who has tried to perfect a craft, and that hurts, man. So you give just enough gas to the fire in some of the cheating incidents that we all can recount in certain things. So so the fact that bass fishing has this little bit of a gray area where you know you, you don't have refs like in a baseball game or a basketball game that are watching every move, and they build this into this wildfire that ends up in somebody getting in a physical altercation at a national tournament, getting in their truck and going, I'm done. You know, that to me is, is really with, with a, not a shred of evidence. That is sad to me. Oh yeah. If you were to come to me, anybody come to me and say, Hey Gary, what would you need to do to be a better angler and win more often? I'd say, well, I need to not have a corporate job that ties up my time 40 hours a week uh, and I need to consistently fish the seven, same body seven of water. children. Yeah, seven kids. And I need to fish, <laughs> you know, every day and put my time on the water and, and I will figure them out. And then when you get somebody like Billy, where you have and you put your hours in, you've worked hard and put your hours in to learn these bodies of water and, and the fish in general. And when you do do that, and then, you, then somebody's accusing you of cheating. Yeah, it was I, I dedicated my life. I mean, there was several relationships lost because of it. I mean, I, I devoted 150% of my life to it. It just, it didn't treat me as well as I thought it was gonna, but, ah, man, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of pain there and there's a lot of stuff that, and and again, I appreciate your, your candidness on it because these are not easy things and you've buried a lot of pain. You've won so many tournaments. So, so much has been said about you we never know where we're going to end up fishing. And again, I, I allude back to Fish Recon and why I think this is an important mission of our own because the fisherman that I was 30 years ago is not who I am today and it's not going to be where. But it's we always have this common bond of the passion for catching fish no matter where we're at or what we're doing. Billy Skinner is an angler and an entrepreneur. We haven't certainly not have heard the last of, I'm, I'm quite sure. You know, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's a good stage. It's a good stage where I'm at right now. I like where I'm at right now. Uh, the tournament side of things, I will, you know, once in a while, Mark uh, Williams in Havasu, he invites me up to fish a tournament. I'll go up there and fish one here and there. Um, and then down here in Yuma, once in a while, I'll fish just a little rod and gun club or something like that, just to keep things fun. You know what I mean? And and other than that, then we go do dirty missions and we focus on the bait company and we do stuff like that. And I like it. I like where I'm at right now. And the tournament scene, you know, when you're going full bore 100 percent, they can have that. But <laughs> no, and it's it's brutal. And I think I think it's important to highlight we all have tournament blood in us. You know, when you've had successes and Gary too is qualifying for the elites and doing the things he's done and, you know, making cuts in national tournaments and, and almost, you know, winning big stuff. It, it courses through your veins and you never forget it. And it's a particular thrill that we love. And, and that's why I thought your story was just so important to tell is that when you kind of move on and graduate from, from the drive that makes you want to fish every single tournament, every time it's there, there's other parts of this passion and this love that we call fishing that we can still continue to do that we base our life around that makes Gary 
leave his job and and buy a place on the river and makes me leave my kids and and some of their activities and go to the delta to the columbia river to texas to go wherever we go to fish and and i'm i gary and i are really looking forward and, and this is something that that we'd love to do with you sometime too and branching out into other species and starting to get into the there's just the passion and the drive and the love that takes us out of the bass world and puts us in other because there's so much opportunity and such a cool thing in the passion that drives everybody that fishes and i think we all still that that's something you never that never goes away it's different in the real world than what you perceive it and i had a perception of the bass fishing world and the tournament fishing world and i was hell-bent on making it to either the flw tour or the bassmaster elite series in 2009 i i went to the central opens and fished those not even thinking about qualifying i just did it to get away from the west and just kind of re- restart and I ended up qualifying for the Elite Series, and then I couldn't get sponsorship to fish them. And I just came to that realization, and I'm, I'm done. I'm just done with it. You know, I mean, I did what I thought was the hardest thing to do, which was to qualify, and now I can't fish because I can't find a friggin' sponsor. And now, obviously, it was, at, you know, during the time of recession. We had the real estate crash, and, and but, you know, I qualified in November, and I had to have my deposits in by December to fish the Elite Series. That's impossible. I, can't, I couldn't do it, and I, I wasn't prepared for it. And I thought, you know what, this just isn't for me. But it doesn't mean that I can't have a career in fishing. And I think, Billy, that's where you're at, right? It doesn't mean you can't have a career in fishing. You've got a rod company. You've got a bait company. You've got a TV show. I mean, you're you're living the dream. It, it may not be the dream that you started out with when you were younger. And I and I know if, if Fish Recon goes where we want it to go, it wasn't the dream that I started out with. But I will still, hopefully end my life with fishing as my pastime and my career. Absolutely, dude. I've had a lot of people, they're like, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to continue fishing. And, and a lot of them are like, dude, you need to keep fishing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is, this is my new path. I love it. And you're right. It wasn't where I started. It wasn't the original dream, but that's, what's exciting about life is you don't ever know. Yeah, and you just that's fo- you got to follow that and and just kind of roll with the punches and see where it takes you if you would ask me five years ago hey you know what do you think about in a few years you're going to be shooting a tv show you're going to do this you're going to do that i just said you're crazy i'm going to fish tournaments for the rest of my life mm-hmm. i had uh, a couple years ago i had uh me and dean were out playing i don't know if you guys have seen our youtube video where we do the ultimate beer fishing yeah i have i love it yeah well, me and me and uh, Dean would always do that and have a suit. I mean, that was just that's something. Rojas, by the way. Yeah, we we'd go out and we you know we'd take us a case of beer and and just go have fun. And that was his release from being on tour, and then my release from I guess being called a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'd go out and we would just have a blast, and and he you know he would be like, dude, you need to come on the Elite Series. You need to go qualify. Blah blah blah. I'm going to do this, this, and that. And, and I go, you know what? I go, Dean, if, if you would have pulled Billy aside five to ten years ago, man, I go, I, I'd have jumped on that opportunity like that. <laughs> I go, I'm just not that guy anymore. And it took a while to explain to him, like, it just, it used to be, but it isn't anymore. I go, and that would be unfair for me to take that opportunity from another young guy that really, really is hungry right now that you can help. You know what I call that, Billy? Because I think all of us have uh, we've kind of talked about it in our own way that's called maturity and it's called really understanding who you are as an individual what your priorities are and, and I'll tell you we we've, we've all fished at, at those levels where there's still that appeal and I we, we all have all of us here have really really close friends that that fish the elites right i mean from dean rojas josh bertrand you know i mean brett height guys that we really know and we really like a lot And those guys bust their butt for what they do. And I have a ton of respect for them. They spend more time behind the wheel of their truck than they do fishing. And, I mean, it's a hard life. They leave their families. They they sacrifice a hell of a lot to do what they do. But, But to really sit there and have the success that you've had, and I know you had high-profile people pulling you in the direction, trying to get you down the road, and you were on the edge a bunch of times of moving to Texas and going you know, going down that road, but to step back and say, hey, man, I, I really feel the pull in a different direction. That is that is maturity that you get when you grow, and you look at all your opportunities, and, and, and I say you've got an entrepreneurial spirit. I've said it for a long time, and I've mm. 
both Gary and I are the same way. I mean, we're always looking how to build the better mousetrapper and reinvent something and redo something just to, you know, hey, man, I think I could do that a little different. So the ability to step back and take a look at it and say, hey, I, I, I know I could do that and I know I could make the commitment. I got the passion, the drive, the work ethic, the whole nine and say, no, that ain't my path. That that takes uh, a bit of maturity that I think we only get when we can grow a full beard and a mustache like I see you have right now. <laughs> and you know what I mean? I mean, it, it just – it, because when I was 20, dude, and 25 years old, I'd leave jobs. I'd leave – and that's like you say. There's there's relationships in the pathway of, of fishing, and there's, there's, there's casualties all the way through my aspiring professional bass fishing career. And it was because I would jump at that before I would – actually sit back and think about the responsibilities and the ramifications and everything involved so you know i i really like you said you said it this way and i feel very privileged to be involved with this wherever it goes is i'm in a i'm in a pretty good spot right now i can pick and choose wild west bass trail has given me the platform to do some things and at my own speed I got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old kid, and, and, and these these kids are involved in everything. My wife works full-time. She's got a career. And so I still get to play in that world without having to be gone 300 days a year. And I wouldn't choose it now if I could. Oh, absolutely. And they, you know what? That was what that was another thing that I wanted and I used to tell Dean all the time is, and it's not that you can't have a family when you're in the Elite Series. Obviously, Dean has a family, and a lot of them do. Successful relationships with their wives and everything like that. But I felt like that lifestyle, that what, once you get into it a little bit and you realize what that lifestyle entails, you know, living out of the hotels. And there was a lot of, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I lived out of my truck. And I go, you know, this down the road, you know, I want kids. I want this. I want that. This this lifestyle isn't going to suit that i want to be around as much as possible dude i just got back from antioch over there at, at the delta and i stayed in a ramada hotel that i wouldn't wish on my enemies and and, and you know, like i said i'm used to and i'm not to say i'm used to the ritz carlton but i i'm used to living pretty clean and pretty and dude I got bit by a spider. My leg swelled up, almost fell off. I felt like there was bed bugs. There was hookers. There was, <laughs> and, and you know, and you're like, I can't wait to get to that shitty boat ramp at big break so I can launch. Cause I'm going to feel better when I'm there. So, you know, it's a sacrifice and that that's to your point. I mean, these guys, and I feel sorry for some of my buddies that have to leave town that have young families and, and yeah, they make it work. But the sacrifice that's involved is just amazing. So, you know, that's where getting comfortable with your ability to do things with the different skill sets that you have really can send you in a pathway to where you can sit there and say, I'm good with this. It's all it's it's really all what you know, you want, what makes you happy when you crawl out of bed every morning. I mean, that, that the guys that are on tour, you know, good for them, because when they get out of bed, that's what they want to be doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there because that that shit is brutal. You know, and when it, when you finish 51st, 54th, 55th, and that guy that finished in front of you just cashed a ten thousand dollar check, it ain't easy to back your boat in the next boat ramp. You got to go to every single freaking day of the week. I mean, that's a grind. It's horrible. It's horrible. They, you know, they. I got buddies. You know, they they drive a tractor for a living. They bail hay or whatever, and they like to glamorize fish the life of fishing. Oh man, you're you're lucky you know you get to do whatever you want and you get you're doing what you love nah like if if you spend just just spend one year i mean that would be my advice to someone that that wants or thinks they want to do it you go spend one year doing it the right way and you know hopefully that it, it that doesn't change your mindset and outlook on it and you do aspire to be a pro and all that but i highly doubt it because it is it is absolutely brutal and you know those top 100 or 112 elite guys every year that are year in and year out my hat's off to them because that is a tough tough life and it's a tough way to make a living and they're constantly working on you know their sponsorships and you know they don't they don't leave the even if they have a you know, a bad tournament, they're not leaving that tournament shaking their head going, damn, you know, that sucks. I didn't catch them. They're, they're leaving that tournament, calling their sponsors, figuring out what they have to do to work for them on their way to the next tournament. 
You know what well, I mean? Well, and a lot of those guys that don't make the cut and they're pissed off and they they had a bad show and they got to go to work at the at the booth the next day, man. You got to get up, shake that off, and you got to go meet nine hundred people that are going to ask you why you didn't catch them. You know, and the, <laughs> I don't need that, man. That's well, brutal. and that's the thing, right? And for me, that was the situation I ran into. I mean, not only could I not find sponsorship to fish the Elite Series after qualifying, it was like, well. My gosh, even if I do find a sponsor, what's that going to last me? One year? And then the next year, I'm back on the street again trying to find another sponsor? I mean, I, could, I couldn't live that way. I, I just couldn't live with that level of uncertainty uh, year to year. Because, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've never had a big corporate sponsor. But I can't imagine they're more, you know, they're more than one or two years. So, I mean, you're, you're, it's constantly the rinse and repeat and go right back at it. Oh, well, and it's just all, I mean, if you know, I remember... You know, if you're a single man and you don't got any ties and you don't got any kids, it's easier to sign a contract like that. Right. Well, I'm good for this year. Well, if, you know, you start having kids and, and wives and stuff like that. You know, that that ain't going to cut it. You you got to you got to have more certainty in your life. That's for sure. So what's uh, so what's next on the horizon for Billy Skinner? So I know you've mentioned on on Facebook, you've got some new models of swim baits coming out. Uh, what's what's your next step? Well, did you see the Peter? <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not bad. <laughs> hey, dude, I haven't seen it, but I've heard from no less than a dozen people and asked me if I saw it. So you, 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 you've made a bit of a, you've made a bit of a splash with the Peter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now we got a, the next step is we got a, we got a seven inch coming out and then we also have a three inch coming out, which I actually got to personally fish the three inch yesterday for the first time, and it's badass. It, it is a gnarly bait. Anywhere that you have, like down here on Mitri, we get this time of year, you got a lot of like, uh, I'm assuming it's shad fry. It, it's real small bait, and fishing it on a four aught odor beast weighted hook, straight braid, smashing them over the weed bed. And it's, mm. it's the same size as the bait. Uh, and then obviously you can use it for a rigs, uh, swim jig trailers, chatterbait trailers, etc. Uh, then we got the big, the bigger seven inch coming out, which you're going to fish on a 10 aught owner beast and more draw power, bigger bites. And that's right now, everything, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen everything we're doing now, everything, every master that we produce now is through a 3d printer. Mm hmm so all the new baits have a completely different 3d finish on them from the well, okay from the five to the seven inch you're going to fish the same rod and we're actually coming out with new cheetah rods in, within the i wouldn't say any later than a month they're almost done but uh you're going to fish they're going to be a seven eight model uh and then a seven four model just for the people that prefer a shorter rod like Chris Kinley. <laughs> well, he needs one. <laughs> no. uh, they don't want to be uh, slapping the water. But. Well, tell us real quick a little bit about the rods and the, and the rods that you guys are. So these are Skinner rods, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're going to be. They're pretty. They're pretty much almost the same as the Skinner rod Swimbait Series Seven Eight. It's a Seven Eighty Six. So, um, but we've done. Uh, full cheater line so they're going to be all redesigned cosmetically and everything like that so they're going to be someone buys a bait i've heard it a, you know a thousand times what rod do i throw it on i'm like shit i should have had a, che a cheater rod but uh so we're going to have the 786 it's a six power seven eight inch uh and it's a it's a heavy action obviously but it has the tip for skipping and then we're going to have the 746, which is the shorter one, uh, same power in action. And then we are going to have a, I believe, a 755 or a 734. Uh, where can people come buy these from you, Billy? I mean, do you have a website? You got a website, right, that people can come get, get a hold of all of this gear from you? Do everything. If you're going to do it personally through me, go to Skinner Rods on Facebook. I don't have a, a website personally. Uh, that, or you can go to www.basstacklemaster.com and they carry everything that we have, but we'll have all that, up. that, that's basically what's coming in the future. We're going to release some, release some different sizes. 
Well, we got the store coming out, so we'd love to feature something for you guys that was unique to, to us. And as we build it, uh, that we could feature and, and sell through through Fish Recon. And uh, as we build the store, so our interest with the store is is to uh, get innovators like yourself and feature your products and, and get stuff that you you guys can, if we have the following and we get national and, and things go the way we, we want it to, we want to be able to feature unique individual entrepreneurial things that you can't find in normal places your bass pro shops or your cabela's or even tackle warehouse which has a tendency to carry stuff and, and carried stuff of yours in the past we want to feature stuff that's only unique to fish recon but also can drive your brand and your your images the way that you wanted to do it too so yeah we're looking forward to something like that down the road um again at once we get up and running full strength uh, uh that that is that is definitely one of our goals you guys have your website open already or how's that going so i've got the website up and it's more or less just a shell it's fishrecon.com we've got the store up but no products yet we're working on some clothing designs and hat designs and then like jimmy said we want to have a very small selection of tackle from specific people that that are exclusive to fish recon so um, we're looking forward to working with you on that secret special fish recon color that will be exclusive to fish recon but yeah to answer your question we are we are online all right hey i got a hell of a shirt guy if you guys thanks for cheap i do need <laughs> no a shirt definitely guy. we can talk about those things a absolutely man i mean i've got you know i i've got all kinds of people that do that stuff but you got you've got a lot of branding and stuff that people that you work with is it a, is it a yuma company no it's actually out of vegas Okay, cool. Okay. Well, we can talk about that stuff for sure. We need some contacts in that direction. And, you know, dude, I really love our logo. I don't know if you've seen it, but Gary and I came up with a logo that really kind of fits the fish recon motif. And, you know, so for example, you know, Kinley makes a couple really unique baits out of his garage and, and he's, he's looking for, for, for a, a place to kind of market those things and and you can go directly what well, like you've done you can go directly to your customer base and take and i told him invitation only is what you but if we if fish recon can and i want quality shit i don't want to i don't want to put anything up there that i wouldn't use myself or that i don't have 100 percent faith in and that we can send you know some of our some of our elite buddies and some of our people to start marketing these kind of things and i really believe that if we put together a, a gut store that has really good shit, not just bass fishing either, I mean, we can expand it into other other genres, that we can even, and, and I'm not, we're not trying to out-compete Tackle Warehouse, so to speak. We want to offer stuff you can't find anywhere else, and you know when it gets to you that it is 100% tested, and it is the best you're going to get. And you're not going to find it anywhere else, you know? So that's kind of the goal of the store. No, that's good. I mean, half the stuff on... Uh, tackle warehouse is just because they showed up at iCast anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So Jimmy highlighted sort of our vision, right? I mean, we don't, we're not in the tackle business. We have no desire to be in the tackle business. We just want something exclusive where, you know, it's, it's from the guys that are in the trenches and it's just custom design. And, um, uh, and it's some place where there's only one place to get it and, and it'll be for us. Um, and, and we want to help promote, you know, those that we work with so we can drive traffic to, uh, to buy other baits, you know, like, you know, from other cheater baits. So with that said, guys, you know, Billy, thank you so much for joining our podcast. It was, it was an absolute ple pleasure talking to you. Really appreciate your insight. And, you know, I commend you on what you're doing and how you're giving back to the fishing community. And, and it's, you know, we've highlighted already in the conversation here, it's not just that you're making baits, but you're you're going through the time and effort to make videos, not, not only showing people how to rig the baits, but how to throw them. And you're giving live footage on the water of you throwing these baits and catching fish. And and so, you know, Billy gave a website, if you wanna, wanna check out the cheater bait and, and order some of those, they work. I've caught fish on them. They work really good. And uh, if you're competing against me, I recommend not using them. Uh, just do something else. Um, <laughs> and the Skinner Rods on the Facebook page. And then, Billy, just one, one last question on, on the show. What's up next for the show? Where, where can people check out the Dirty Missions show? They can go to the World Fishing Network. Um, it's national television, so check that out. I believe it's channel 394 or something like that. Um, and check out the Dirty Missions. Um, I want to thank both of you, Gary and Jimmy, for having me on this show. I think what you guys are doing is super cool as well. And anytime you want me back, just give me a call and I'll be on here and we can talk fishing again. We will definitely take you up on that. Thank you to Billy. Thank you to our faithful listeners. 
You can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.fishrecon.com. We will be having an exclusive cheater swimbait color on our website. It is called the Cheater Pumpkin Eater. It is a killer color. It is going to catch the heck out of fish. So check it out on our store. You may also check us out on Facebook, Fish Recon. Follow us on YouTube. We have a good YouTube channel. We're continually building content. That's also at Fish Recon. Follow us on Instagram, Fish Recon Podcast. Till next week, folks, tight lines and bent rods. I have a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for fish like you. I will look for you. I will find you. And when I do, I will catch you. Big fish, big fish. All the way in the bottom, all the way in the bottom. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> look at that fish. <laughs> yes! Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Dude, he's a monster. Oh.